Good morning. Um, excuse us for the um, delay uh, this morning, but uh, I want to welcome you to the meeting of uh, the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. I'm Council Member uh, Francisco Moya, the Chairperson of the Subcommittee. Uh, and today we are joined by Council Members Grudencheck uh, and Council Member Richards. Uh, today we will hold hearings on a number of applications. If you are here to testify on an item for which the record is not already closed, uh, please fill out the speaker slip and uh, give it to the Sergeant at Arms indicating your full name, uh, the name and the LU number of the application you wish to testify on, and whether you are speaking for or against the item. Uh, please note that we will be laying over resolution uh, 748 and authorizing resolution pursuant to section 363 of the city charter, also known as the Staten Island Bus Franchise uh, Resolution, authorizing resolution. Our first hearing of, of today is on a pre-considered LU item for the 66 Hudson Yards uh, streetscape in council, uh, in council Speaker Johnson's district in Manhattan. Uh, the applicant seeks approval to, uh, of a zoning text amendment affecting the special Hudson Yards district to modify certain requirements relating to the ground floor and mandatory improvements for sub-area A2 in a large-scale plan sub-district A as well as to clarify planting requirements along West 34th Street. As proposed, the proposed action would facilitate the development of a new Class A office building in Hudson Yards with approximately 2.2 million square feet and which would serve as a new headquarters for Pfizer as the anchor tenant. The building's ground floor would be accessible to the public and would include several retail spaces. Uh, I want to now open the public hearing on this application uh, and call up uh, David uh, Kranowski and uh, Amir Sperling. Council, if you can please swear in the panel. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? I do. I do. And please state your name for the record. Uh, David Karnofsky, Fried Frank, Land Use Council, to the application. Amir Sperling, Tishman Spire. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, David Karnofsky, Fried Frank. Um, this is an application by 509 West 34th LLC, which is an affiliate of Tishman Spire for a text amendment to modify requirements of the Hudson Yards regulations relating to the site bounded by 35th Street, 10th Avenue, West 34th, and Hudson Boulevard East to be developed as a commercial office building known as the Spiral. Uh, the site is located in subarea A2 of Hudson Yards and is zoned to allow up to 33 uh, FAR. Uh, at 33 FAR, the building would be uh, 2.225 million square feet. At ground level, the current regulations require that along 34th Street, 10th Avenue, and Hudson Boulevard East, that building lobby entrances be limited to a 40-foot width. Uh, this illustrative uh, site plan shows the condition that would e exist under the current uh, regulations with regard to the lobby width. Um, this currently permitted lobby frontage width is simply inadequate for the over 2 million square foot full block high density office building plan for the site which is projected to have a population of between 10,000 and 14,000 office workers, other employees, and visitors. The two primary entrances for building users will be on Hudson Boulevard East, close to the number seven entrance on 10th Avenue and on 10th Avenue, which will accommodate pedestrian traffic coming from, on the one side, Penn Station and the Port Authority bus terminal, and on the other side, uh, the, seventh, uh, the number seven line station. Uh, given this, the applicant is proposing a text amendment that would allow for lobby frontage of up to 70 feet on the avenues. This would provide a more appropriate scale of lobby width while maintaining the overall retail character of the block. The increase in lobby width would also improve circulation into and out of the building, particularly at morning and evening peak travel times. This next slide uh, shows the plan with a condition that would be allowed under the text amendment. Uh, let's go back one, 70 feet. Um, the text amendment would apply to developments of more than 2 million square feet on a site with full block frontage on both 10th and Hudson Boulevard East located within this sub-area. 
The second aspect of the text amendment relates to a provision which calls for the planting of a double row of trees along West 34th Street. The concept under the urban design plan under for Hudson Yards was to require a sidewalk widening of 10 feet along 34th Street and the planting of a row of street trees along the street edge of the widening in addition to the row of trees that are otherwise required under standard regulations, thereby creating a grand pedestrian alley along the city sidewalk with a secondary pedestrian route within the 10-foot widening area. The actual text was written in such a way that the double row planting requirement reads as if it applies not just to 34th Street, but also to Hudson Boulevard East and 35th Street. Now, mandatory sidewalk widenings are required along those frontages, but the sidewalk windings are only five feet wide. So therefore, uh, along Hudson Boulevard East and 31st Street, the planting, the planting of an extra row of trees along the street edge of the widening would result in the sidewalk widening having an effective width of only a couple of feet, and uh, it would really be unable to function as a secondary pathway. The proposed text amendment would clarify that the double planting requirement was intended only to apply along West 34th Street itself, and this is the condition that would be allowed uh, under the text amendment. Uh, I would be glad to answer any questions, and Amir Sperling is here as well to answer any questions you may have. All good. Thank you very much for your uh, testimony today. I appreciate you coming down here. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, are there any other members uh, of the public who wish to testify on this item? Seeing none, uh, I now close a public hearing uh, on this application, and it will be laid over. Our next hearing is on LU's uh, 403-404 for the 47-15 34th Avenue rezoning in Council Member Van Bramer's district in Queens. Uh, the applicant seeks approval of a zoning map amendment to rezone the project area for existing C81, R6B, and R5 zoning districts to R7X C24 and R. 6B C24 zoning districts and a related zoning text amendment to map the site within a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing MIH option 2. As proposed, these actions would facilitate the development of a new 14-story mixed-use building with approximately 201 dwelling units, including approximately 61 uh, permanently affordable units as well as uh, approximately 8,600 8, square feet of ground floor commercial use and approximately 4,800 square feet of ground floor community facility use. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application uh, and I will call up uh, Frank St. Jean. Yep. Good morning. Good morning. And just one second, Council, if you could please uh, swear in the panel. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? I do. And please state your name for the record. Frank St. Jacques, Thank Ackerman you. LLP for the applicant. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair Moya and subcommittee members. Um, again, my name is Frank St. Jacques from Ackerman LLP, um, and, and I'm appearing on behalf of the applicant, Ashley Young LLC and John Young LLC to, to present this land use application. The applicant is seeking a zoning map amendment to change medium density R5 and R6B and auto-oriented C81 zoning districts to R7D and R6B districts with a C2 overlay on two block fronts along 34th Avenue as it intersects Northern Boulevard and Queens Community District 1. The applicant initially saw an R7X district, but, city planning, but the City Planning Commission approved this application with a modification changing the R7X to an R7D district. The applicant is also seeking a zoning text amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary, inclusionary housing area with option two. The rezoning area uh, shown in this slide is shaded in red. Uh, it's half of the block front between 46th and 47th streets and the full block front between 47th and 48th streets. Uh, the rezoning area is within the transit zone and located one block south of the 46th Street MR subway station at Broadway. Northern Boulevard serves as a dividing line between the residential context to the north and the big box retail and auto sales uses uh, to the south of Northern Boulevard. This is clearly shown on the next slide. 
Uh, this map shows the site's location on 34th Avenue, which is a wide street that is primarily mixed residential, uh, a primarily mixed residential and commercial corridor with pre-war multifamily walk-up buildings. 34th Avenue is zoned R6B with C1 and C2 overlays. It transitions to light industrial and automotive uses moving east to Northern Boulevard around the rezoning area. To the north of the rezoning area, there's a large mid-density R5 zoning district characterized by two and three-story pre-war multifamily buildings. Northern Boulevard is a wide street and is considerably wider where it intersects with 34th Avenue directly in front of the site. Northern Boulevard is a major arterial road through, through Queens, primarily mapped with C8 and M1 districts in this area and characterized by auto-oriented uses in big box retail buildings with large service parking lots. The affected sites are shown in the tax map. Uh, the rezoning area is outlined in red dots and the development site between 47th and 48th streets is shaded red uh, in this image. You can also see uh, the width of 34th Avenue and Northern Boulevard directly in front of the development site here. The development site is an approximately 30,574 uh, 30, square foot rectangular corner and through lot uh, with 200 feet of frontage on 34th Avenue and is about 150 feet deep along 47th and 48th streets. The existing buildings at the site represent the maximum development possible at the site today with the current C81 zoning district. Uh, C81 zoning district has a maximum FAR of 1.0 or 2.4 for permitted community facility uses, but does not allow residential use. Uh, this slide shows the non-applicant owned properties that were included in the rezoning area. Uh, this was done to avoid leaving an isolated C81 zoning district between the existing R6B map to the west and the proposed R7D C24 to the east. Lots 1 and 70 uh, in this area are entirely in the C81 zoning district are improved with two-story buildings. The proposed zoning map amendment would map a new R7D on the block front between 47th and 48th streets and pull the existing R6B zoning district boundary east from the mid-block between 46th and 47th street over to 47th street. The C24 overlay mapped to a depth of 150 feet permits a range of local retail and service uses that relate to the existing patterns along 34th Avenue and provide new opportunities for businesses. So this is an overview of the, the proposed development. Uh, these actions would facilitate the development of a new 11-story mixed-use residential, commercial, and community facility building at the development site. The R7D district is appropriate at the site because it is located at the intersection of two wide streets near public transit on an underutilized C81 zone property. The proposed rezoning would remove the outdated C81 zoning that's intended for auto-related uses and would allow the development of new housing with a requirement for permanently income-restricted units under MIH. Queens Community District 1 had a 2.5% rental vacancy rate and 40.5% 40, 40 of the households in the district are rent burdened. The proposed development would provide approximately 171 square feet of floor area uh, with 187 units, 130 of which would be market rate and 57 of which would be uh, MIH with 77 parking spaces in a cellar uh, uh, below grade uh, parking structure. The commercial is contemplated as locally oriented retail and service uses uh, or eating and drinking establishment uses. The applicant is seeking a preschool for the community facility and is committed to providing space to a local nonprofit urban upbound to provide comprehensive employment and financial services to the community. I'll just run quickly through the next few slides. The site plan shows that the building's height and mass are con concentrated at the southeast corner of the site at 34th Avenue and Northern Boulevard. The building steps down to four stories starting approximately 40 feet from the zoning district boundary uh, of the R5 district to the north. A required yard is also provided along the district boundary. It's approximately 14 feet. This will serve as a driveway for the building and will be screened with fencing and landscaping. The first floor plan shows that the commercial space, uh, about um, just under 9,000 square feet, would have frontage on 34th Avenue and would wrap the corners, but not to the full depth of the building. The community facility space, uh, about 5,000 square feet, would be located on 47th Street, and the residential entrance would be located on 48th Street. 
and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, can you just please uh, sort of provide for me and or walk me through the uh, rationale for the proposed uh, commercial overlays that are mapped as part of this application? Um, in particular, why uh, was the C2 overlay chosen and not uh, a C1 overlay? Yes, um, just pulling up a slide here. Um, it's a little hard to see on, on this map, but uh, on the left-hand side of the screen, there are uh, currently C24, or sorry, C2 overlays mapped along uh, 34th Avenue, uh, and we believe that this uh, the, the proposed C2 commercial overlay uh, fits within the context of the uh, existing C2 overlays mapped on 34th Street. The difference really between the C1 and the, the C2 overlay is a matter of, of uses. Um, the applicant here is, is concerned with, with limiting the, the potential uses uh, with a, a C1 versus a C2. Primarily, the, the ability to apply to the Board of Standards and Appeals for a PCE special permit, which is a, a, to allow a gym at this site. Uh, the thinking here is that in a relatively soft retail market, uh, they want to have the, the ability to tenant the space. Uh, one of the ways to do that is, is to seek other uses, such as, as a gym, which would also be a, a, a locally oriented use that, that would serve the community. Okay. And why was the overlay mapped uh, at a depth of 150 rather than the community board's um, uh, request of 100? Sure. So. As you can see, the, the overlay is, is mapped to the depth of the site itself, uh, mapping it uh, to a, 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 a different depth would uh, potentially create issues with uh, if parking were provided uh, for the, the, the commercial space. Um, so it just provides uh, sufficient flexibility. It's not encroaching into any of the residential uses, um, and we believe that the, the most marketable commercial space would be along uh, 34th Avenue. Uh, so it's it's configured now that it's 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 going to be away from the residential uses, but having it mapped to that depth just provides uh, flexibility, and, and so we're not running any, into any issues later with with things such as parking. All right, let's let's stick with parking for a second. Sure. So how much parking is proposed on uh, the site? So a, as I mentioned, um, the this application was initially filed with with an R7X. Um, that's uh, a, a would have allowed about 201 units. The modification down to R7D um, resulted in the elimination of about 14 units. Um, despite that, uh, the the seller uh, parking garage um, can hold about 77 self-parking spaces, and the applicant has maintained that that number of parking spaces despite the reduction in uh, in, in dwelling units. So that's that's to say that the requirement was previously for 77 actually a little shy of 77. Uh, the reduction it resulted in a lower parking requirement, but that same uh, number of parking spaces is going to be maintained. Okay, uh, and where will the curb cuts be located? So the curb cuts, I'll just go to the site plan, basically at the rear of the site. Um, if you can see sort of on the, the top of the screen, mm -hmm. uh, there's curb cuts on 48th and 47th Street. Um, and then below the, the green landscape deck, uh, the parking entrance, actually. So you can see cars will come in on 48th and 47th uh, and uh, enter the parking garage through the center of the site, or the center of the building. Got it. Um, and just a, two more quick questions. Uh, why was MIH option one not included in this application? Um, and would you still be able to develop under MIH option one scenario? So the, um, the, the thinking with, with MIH option two is that it would provide uh, more units of affordable housing ultimately, 20, or excuse me, 30% rather than 25% uh, in a building um, that was uh, initially 201 units, now 187 units that had a, a, a you know, significant, there was a significant difference in the amount of units. Um, since uh, meeting with the, the community board, uh, the applicant has uh, committed to providing two of the income bands at 60% AMI under MIH option two. Uh, we're still working out what that third income band would be, but that we believe is, is, is meeting the community board's 
um, requests for uh, for lower levels of affordability uh, at this, or I guess higher levels of affordability at, at lower income levels. Okay. Um, and then lastly, you, you, you might have said this, but uh, I just want to make sure. Has there been an organization that has been selected for the proposed commercial or community facility that uh, is being proposed on the site? Uh, not yet. Besides Urban Upbound, which will um, take some of the community facility space for their comprehensive uh, 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 employment uh, services, um, we're still working with the local council member to determine uh, potentially an arts-related uh, uh, community facility, nonprofit, uh, to take some of that space. The applicant has also been discussing with a, 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 a potential preschool there, but as we um, discuss this further with the council member, we'll obviously know more. Great. Thank you so much for your testimony today. Thank you. Thank you. I, I'd like to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Member uh, Reynoso. Uh, thank you for being here today. I am now going to call up uh, the next panel. We have Reverend Corwin Mason, uh, Annie Cohen Morris, and Wanda Sub. Suberry, is that it? How do you say it? Suberry, thank you. Wanda Suberry, welcome. You can take a seat anywhere. Just make sure that. Your microphones are turned on, and uh, just state your name, and you can begin whenever you're ready. And we will start with Wanda. Okay. Uh, good morning, Chair Moya. I'm a member of the Zoom meeting. My name is Wanda, and I'm working in Google Building as a cleaner. And I have been a member of 32BJ for six years. And I'm here today on behalf of my union to spread our support to 47, 15, 34 Avenue resume. As you know, 32 VA represents more than 80,000 property service workers in New York City. We clean and maintain buildings like the other, uh, like the one proposed. We believe that developers should commit to providing good building service just in order to build a more equitable economy in New York City. We are pleased to inform you that Ashley John LLC, the developers seeking the reasoning, has committed to provide prevailing wage just to build service workers once the development is complete. Most building service jobs are filled by local members of the community, and we believe this development will bring economy opportunities to working families that we allow them to live with dignity. For this reason, respectfully, you're you to approve this reasoning. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Good morning. If you could just uh, make sure that the microphone is on and just state your name. <laughs> if the red light is on, then you know. Once it. You. There you oh, go. okay. There you go. Well, okay. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Ann Cotton Morris. I'm the TA president of Woodside Houses, which is one block away from <clears throat> where this um, building is going to be is going to be built. <laughs> and um, I support it because <clears throat> they offered the Woodside Houses to be a part of their um, planning. Number one, a pre-K, which we need in our community, uh, is one of the things that that we love the workforce. Most of the housing developments around us, uh, they have the workforce office and it works well with them. And at some Woodside Houses, which has 1,358 units, would love to have this for the people in our community also. The, um, the uh, organization's been trying to get a place in the neighborhood and it was offered and we would love this to happen. I've talked with the community and they're ecstatic about it. They really want this to come to be a part of our community. So hopefully you will work with us and make us happy in the Woodside Houses. 
Thank you. Thank and the you. units. I've been in Woodside Houses all my life, and I would love. To, I love the community, and I might want to move down the block and stay in the community, <laughs> but get out of NYCHA, but I love the community, so I want to stay there. But anyway, great. that's why I support it. Thank you so much. Thank mm -hmm. you for being here this morning. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Pastor Corwin Mason, com uh, pastor of the Community Church of, of Astoria and Astoria, Queens. I am for the project uh, because it provides affordable housing um, for uh, some of my membership who lives in Woodside. Um, also, they will benefit from the workforce development, uh, which, um, which is hosted by the uh, Urban Upbound that offers financial services as well. So I, I think it will be an asset to the community um, and, and provide um, the necessary services that the people need. So. Great. Thank you uh, all for your testimony today. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? I'm seeing none. Uh, I now close the public hearing on this application and it will be laid over. We are now going to uh, jump to our votes. Uh, today we will vote on approval uh, to approve LUs 3, 391, 392 for the 1050 Pacific Street rezoning in Brooklyn. The proposed action would rezone an existing M11 district to an M14 R7A special mixed use district and map the project area as a mandatory inclusionary housing area with MIH option one and option two. Uh, together, these actions would facilitate the development of a new eight-story mixed-use residential commercial building with approximately 103 units, uh, approximately 16,000 square feet of ground floor commercial use, and 42 below-grade accessory parking spaces. Uh, Majority Leader uh, Cumbo is in support of this application. We will also approve LUs 393, 394 for the 1010 Pacific Street rezoning in Brooklyn. The proposed actions would rezone an existing M11 district to an R7D C24 district and map the project area as a mandatory inclusionary housing area with MIH option one and option two. These actions would, uh, would use these, the action before us uh, had been modified by the City Planning Commission as part of the public review process. The Commission modified the proposal from an R7D C24 district to an R7A C24 district. The modified uh, CPC approval would permit a nine-story mixed-use development, including approximately 124 dwelling units and commercial and community facilities uh, that would be utilized uh, on the lower floors. Majority Leader Cumbo is in support of this application as modified by the City Planning Commission. We will also vote to approve with modifications LU's 390 for the, for the 270 Park Avenue text amendment in Manhattan. The proposed action would amend the zoning text relating to the East Midtown subdistrict of the Special Midtown District and would facilitate a 10,000 square foot open publicly accessible space on the proposed development site's Madison Avenue frontage instead of within its uh, through lot portion, uh, as well as modified uh, modify other subdistrict regulations necessary to make this alternative location viable. The request action would facilitate a new office building approximately seven stories tall with approximately 1.87 million square feet of floor area. Uh, we will be modifying the 270 Park Avenue zoning text to clarify the waivers for the public space are only applicable on this site, consistent with the intent of the application. Council Member Powers is in support of this application as modified, and we will also vote to approve pre-considered LUs 386 through 389 for the 1921 Atlantic Avenue rezoning in Brooklyn. The application seeks approval of a zoning, uh, a zoning map amendment to rezone the project area from an M11 R7D district to an R8A C24 district. A related zoning text amendment to map the site, a, to map the site of a mandatory inclusionary housing area util, utilizing option one. Designa designation and project approval of an urban development uh, action area project and dis disposition approval and an amendment to the Saratoga Square 
urban renewal plan to permit residential and commercial uses. As proposed, these actions would facilitate the development of a new 14-story mixed-use building, including retail use on the ground floor, community uh, space, uh, approximately 235 affordable housing units, outdoor recreational space, uh, and other residential amenities, and 44 below grade accessory parking spaces. Uh, Council Member Ampri Samuels is in support of this application. I'd also want to take this moment to acknowledge that we've been joined by Councilwoman uh, Rivera. Uh, I now call for uh, a vote. Uh, I now call for a vote to approve LUs uh, 391, 392, uh, 393, 394, and the pre-considers LUs 386 to 389, and to approve with modifications uh, that I have described, LU 390. Uh, Council, uh, please call the roll. Chair Moya. Uh, aye on all. Council Member Reynoso. I vote aye on all. Council Member Richards. Aye on all. Council Member Rivera. Aye on all. Council Member Grudenchik. Aye. I vote of five in the affirmative, zero in the negative, zero abstaining. The land use items are approved and referred to the full land use committee. And we're gonna we're gonna leave the 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 roll open um, and continue with the rest of our hearings. Our next hearing is on a pre-considered LU item for the MANA products uh, text amendment, also in Council Member Van Bramer's district in Queens. The applicant seeks approval of a zoning text amendment to facilitate the expansion of an existing building in an M32 zoning district to accommodate manufacturing uses uh, by up to an approximately 108 square feet. The requested action would facilitate the enlargement of the existing building, allowing the applicant to uh, consolidate and streamline its operations into a single location. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application, um, and I call up uh, Jay Siegel, uh, Rachel Scal, uh, Lawrence uh, Weinstock, and Robert uh, Gailey. Gailey. Thank you. Uh, council, uh, please swear in the panel. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and you will answer all questions truthfully? I do. Yes. I do. Please, please state your full names for the record. Robert Jagley. Jay Siegel. Lawrence Weinstock. Rachel Skull. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Moya and members of the subcommittee. My name is Rachel Skull. I'm an associate at Greenberg Charig. I'm joined today by my colleague, Jay Siegel. We represent Mana Products, one of the country's leading manufacturer, contract manufacturers of cosmetics. Mana conducts its operations at two locations in Long Island City, located approximately three quarters of a mile apart, 3202 Queens Boulevard, between Van Damme Street and 32nd Place, and 2711 49th Avenue, referred to as Hunter's Point, located at the corner of 27th Street and 49th Avenue, backing onto the Dutch Kills. As you will soon hear from MANA's representatives, operating in two separate facilities is inefficient, and the company would like to enlarge its Hunter's Point facility by approximately 108,000 square feet and consolidate its manufacturing operations there. The consolidation would allow increased efficiency, increased production, and would allow the company to hire additional employees. The Hunter's Point building obtained its first certificate of occupancy in 1965. Had it been constructed four years earlier, Section 43.121 of the zoning resolution would allow our proposed enlargement as of right. Consequently, because the building was constructed, or completed rather, in 1965, we are seeking a text amendment to allow the 108,000 square, square foot enlargement of the Hunter's Point building. Um, I'm joined today by Larry Weinstock, Vice President of Finance, and Robert Jagley, uh, Senior Vice President of Operations from MANA. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Larry and he'll tell you some more about the company and its operations. Thank you, Rachel. Good morning, council members. I'm Larry Weinstock, Vice President of Finance of MANA Products since 1993. MANA is a local manufacturer of cosmetics and hair care products. It's privately held and family owned one of the nation's largest and most well-known contract manufacturers. 
but actually it has three different lines of business. It has contract manufacturing for 75%. That's when we produce make-to-order products for big name brands. We have private label for about 10% where we put on specific salon labelings on our made-to-stock products. And for 15%, we have our own owned brands. The original founder was Nikos Mujeres. He started at a, as a bench chemist at Cheeseboro Ponds after getting local degrees at Rutgers and St. John's. After one year of working at Cheeseboro Ponds, as the story goes, Nikos borrowed $6,000 from his brother and founded Manor in Manhattan in 75. He quit Cheeseboro Ponds saying, I know how to do this. He bought some chemicals, a table, a small osterizer blender. That was it, he didn't have enough money for a chair. And he filled 10,000 eyeshadow pans, put them in a briefcase, and went knocking on businesses uh, door to door. By 1978, he had moved the business to its current Long Island City location in Queens Boulevard. In 84, he bought the eight-story building with 320,000 square feet. By 1998, we had outgrown the Queens Boulevard building, and he purchased our second Long Island City building at Hunters Point for an additional 220,000 square feet. The second building helped us become more efficient as it had a more favorable layout for manufacturing and we began to operate more horizontally than vertically, floor to floor. Currently, the manufacturing is split. In Queens Boulevard, we have R&D, we have product development, and we manufacture and store the formulas. Afterwards, at Hunter's Point, we, uh, we have storage of the raw materials after manufacture, we assembly and package the finished goods, and we have warehousing and some shipping. So the good news and the bad news is that we have continued to grow. We have experienced 9% sales growth over the last five years and 8% compounded sales growth over the last 15 years. But we have grown and outgrown our ability to efficiently use the current space, which hurts us competitively. To best compete, we need more efficient manufacturing operations that can be consolidated into one larger location that would allow us to create a more efficient production line like our competitors in New Jersey and in Westchester. New Jersey in particular was extremely aggressive in courting us, offering low cost areas to manufacture and many tax incentives to relocate. But MANA has traditionally been very loyal to its employees, of which 92% live in New York City. And we have many long-term employees. I've completed 26 years here now, and there are still 46 employees who have more seniority than I do. As of year-end, December, we had 840 full-time employees, roughly split two-thirds at Hunters Point and one-third at Queens Boulevard. Over the last eight years, MAN has provided over $1.3 million in college scholarships to our employees and to their children. Over the last three years, MANA has provided over $155,000 in college scholarships to LaGuardia College, whom we partner with across the street, and we take interns from them also. To remain in Long Island, Long Island City, and to remain competitive, we are looking to consolidate all of our manufacturing operations in the one Hunters Point location. This proposal would allow us to consolidate and provide space for manufacturing growth. We would expect to further grow our full-time workforce by five to 25% over the five years afterwards. So MANA has been in Long Island City since 1978. MANA has been a Long Island City property owner since 1984. MANA has invested in Long Island City and in the people, and MANA would like to stay in Long Island City Please help us stay. We're happy to answer any questions that you may have. Great, thank you, um, St. John's alum. So uh, 
Just one, uh, just a couple of quick questions. Will this uh, proposed uh, tax modification, uh, tax uh, modification, allow for uh, new opportunities for expanding manufacturing uses beyond uh, the applicant's development site? So the text is tailored so that it's only the applicant's site. Um, I know that city planning was very enthusiastic about this text amendment, so I don't know if they would possibly look looking at this for other sites in the future, um, but we are we are the first ones to come forward and ask for this text amendment, and they have they have been very interested in it. Great. And are you planning to utilize the Newtown Creek for uh, freight movement at all, or no? Or the Dutch Kills? Yeah, Dutch Kills. Okay. No. Okay. Uh, and also, since the location is in a flood zone, uh, does the proposed expansion require any resiliency measures uh, to be included uh, on the site? So the, so the way that the proposed expansion is built, it's actually this wedge shape that kind of hooks up to the existing building, and the ground floor is going to be kept essentially open so that that can still be used for shipping and receiving. So the de design itself is already incorporating the, the flood measures, but yes, it will, be, um, it will be built pursuant to Appendix G to the extent that it applies to the site, building code Appendix G and any flood, any flood measures. Great. Thank you all for your testimony today. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Uh, are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application, and it will be laid over. Uh, I now will uh, open up the vote. Uh, on a continuing vote on the land use items, Council Member Constantinidis. I vote aye. I vote of six in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions. The land use items are approved and referred to the full land use committee. Our last hearing for today is on pre-considered LU items for the East Harlem follow-up action in Council Member Ayala's district in Manhattan. Uh, the applicant seeks approval of a zoning uh, map amendment to remove the special district designation from an existing uh, R7B zoning district as well as a zoning text amendment to establish and reduce maximum allowable uh, building heights in the existing C64, R8A, and uh, R7D districts mapped along Park Avenue in the special East Harlem Corridor District. Uh, and to require any development at the intersection of Lexington Avenue and East 116th Street uh, to relocate a subway entrance from the street into the zoning lot. The proposed actions were agreed upon and memorialized in the East Harlem Neighborhood Rezoning Points of Agreement. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application, and I would like to call up Calvin Brown. Thank you, Calvin. Um, Council, if you can please swear in the panel. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? Yes. Please say your uh, full name for the record. It's Calvin Brown. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Chairman and Council Members. My name is Calvin Brown. I'm a senior planner in the Manhattan office at the Department of City Planning. The Department is proposing a zoning map amendment and zoning text amendments as follow-up actions to the East Harlem Neighborhood Rezoning, which was approved by the Council in 2017. These actions respond to concerns that were heard during and post the public review process by the public and elected officials and memorialized in the East Harlem Points of Agreement. The East Harlem Neighborhood Rezoning was a comprehensive community-focused uh, effort aimed at identifying land use and zoning opportunities for the creation of new mixed income housing, as well as the preservation of existing affordable housing that was consistent with the mayor's housing plan. And it responded to the land use and zoning recommendations that were included in the East Harlem Steering Committee's neighborhood plan. As a result of this comprehensive plan, approximately 92 blocks um, were rezoned, roughly bounded by East 104th Street to the south, uh, East 132nd to the north, Park Avenue to the west, and 2nd Avenue to the east. Um, as part of the city's effort to advance this comprehensive neighborhood investment strategy, the administration created um, points of agreements that will allow the public to track and identify the various commitments that were made across uh, the city agencies. The East Harlem Points of Agreement had over 50 commitments um, from the various agencies. 
which include um, commitments ranging from housing, open space, arts, culture, and land use. This presentation focuses on the commitments that were made by the Department of City Planning. Um, the three commitments that were included in these follow-up actions was to establish a height limit in the R10 district on Park Avenue between East 122nd and East 124th Street, um, follow-up on correcting the heights in the portion of Park Avenue between East 115th Street and East 118th Street, and to integrate subway station entrance into the building envelope at the intersection of East 116th and Lexington Avenue. At the time of the City Planning Commission approval, as you can see on the image to the left, um, there was no height limits in the C64 district. Um, and the height of 215 was put into scope for other portions along Park Avenue. So a part of this follow-up actions um, in the C64 districts, the follow-up actions are proposing to establish a height of 275 feet which is consistent with the other districts that were mapped in the area in the M16 and the R10 district and the R10 um, to the south. In the southern portion of Park Avenue between um, 115th Street and East 118th Street, we will lower the heights from 215 to match the underlying districts that were finally mapped, which were the R8A and the R7D. So we'll lower the height from 215 to 145 in the R8A, and in an R7D, it will lower the height from 215 to 125. The other action that's included as part of this follow-up action is to integrate the subway station into the building's envelope at the intersection of 116th Street and Lexington Avenue. Um, pursuant to section 3740, um, there were some concerns because of the density that the administration was proposing at this intersection. So the community wanted us to require that subway entrance be relocated off of the street to ease pedestrian circulation at this intersection. So as pursuant to section 3740, um, any zoning lot that has um, square footage of 5,000 square feet or more would be required to incorporate the subway entrance into the zone a lot. There's actually one um, property that actually will fit, will be required to do this if they develop and it's the one that's indicated with the star. Um, and as a follow-up corrective action, um, the R7B was uh, uh, mistakenly put into the special district, and there are certain controls in the special district that are really um, uh, for the high density districts that we propose, the R10s and the R9s. The R7B is a medium density district, so we're removing it from the special district, and this is a corrective action that is a part of the application as well. Thank you. Uh, just a few questions. Sticking with the MTA, um, with the ATM improve, uh, MTA improvements, uh, will those be ADA accessible? Yes, they will be required to be. And do the stairwells count towards the building's uh, FAR? Um, so th this is slightly different than the Second Avenue. This is a, a requirement. So in this, at this intersection, we treat it the R9 very much different than the other R9s that were mapped in East Harlem. So this has a maximum height of 205 feet, whereas the other R9s in this rezoning area was capped at 175. Okay. And who pays for the stairwells? The uh, property owner would be required to do so. The MTA does not? So as the process is the property owner would sit down with the with MTA just to see if it's even feasible to do so. Um, they will work with the, the property owner to make sure that they can ac accommodate the entrance way, but the cost is encumbered upon the property owner. Got it. Okay. Thank you very much for your okay. testimony. I now will call up Eli Kim. Good morning, council members. Good morning. 
Uh, my name is Eli Kim, and I'm a first-generation Korean-American. Since 1981, my family has owned and operated Race All Drugs, an independent community pharmacy on the southwest corner of East 116th Street and Lexington Avenue. My father and I, both pharmacists, work side by side there every single day, managing both the pharmacy and the property ourselves. The property I'm referring to includes the entire single-story area of the corner, which includes Race All Drugs, as well as the four stores along 116th Street and three stores along Lexington Avenue for a total footprint of 8,000 square feet. Unfortunately, due to circumstances out of our control, the days of operating a community pharmacy profitably seem to be numbered. So we have been looking at our options for the property. Until recently, it seemed as though development was the best option for all involved. A potential building here would create one or two stories of valuable retail space with potential community usage. And with the 30% mandatory inclusionary housing allotment, the neighborhood would gain valuable affordable housing. Proposals we have received estimated that up to 100 residential units could be built here. However, recent proposals have derailed our plans. My request today is that the commission disapprove the action that would require the subway entrances at this intersection to be placed inside of any new construction. We have consulted with developers, architects, and contractors, all of whom have qu quoted the cost of this addition in the millions, and it is a cost that makes development impossible for us. It was already a daunting and extremely risky project for us to begin with, but this proposal now adds a very large expense, potential delays due to MTA bureaucracy, as well as lost square footage and street frontage from the ground floor retail, which severely impacts revenue. That basically leaves us with one option, which is to lease the entire space to a credit tenant or chain store, such as a CVS, who we would give it to for no less than 20 years. This, of course, means no development at all, no affordable housing, and the displacement of a large number of minority-owned small businesses, not to mention that the subway entrance would remain as is indefinitely. I ask the Commission to please reconsider the subway entrance requirement. Thank you. Just one, one quick question. Um, have you had conversations with the MTA? Uh, we've been trying to have a conversation, but we haven't um, gotten a meeting with them yet, no. So n no conversations with the MTA, no discussion about whether or not they would uh, contribute or pay for the stairwells? It's my understanding that that cost, that burden is going to be on us, but I haven't been able to uh, speak to them directly yet to get a definitive answer. Okay. Okay, thank you very much for your testimony today. Thank you. Are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application and it will be laid over. Um, I'm now reopening the votes for Mr. Punctuality, uh, Councilmember Torres. On uh, a continuing vote of the land use items, uh, Councilmember Torres. I vote aye, and I was punctual on de Blasio time, so. Julie noted. By a vote of seven in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstaining, the land use items are approved and referred to the full land use uh, committee. Uh, this concludes today's meeting. I would like to thank the members of the public, my colleagues, and of course always the uh, council and land use staff uh, for their uh, hard work. Thank you. This meeting is hereby adjourned. <laughs>